Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. And today I have Eddie's mullet back, and we are going to be talking about Volume 2 of Venom by Al Ewing and Rom V and Brian Hitch. So, Eddie, once again, say hi to the parasites. Hey, hey. <laughs> awesome. And in the last episode, we, Eddie and I were just discussing this between episodes. Uh, it was hard not to spoil anything from this volume in, in our discussion of the first episode because every actually a lot of pages get reused and sometimes they cover dialogue with new dialogue and sometimes they leave it as is or they just use a couple panels but th this book has like a you mentioned uh back to the future in the last episode it has like a back to the future 2 vibe where you go back to the begin or the ending of the first film and you have like oh i i see that scene but now it's from a different angle so there's a lot of that so you you kind of get lost uh, in the where is eddie in time discussion so Let's dive right into this one. This picks up right where the last one left off. We got a hint of maybe who Meridius is because he ends the first volume by saying we are Venom and his face changes and he's got the teeth and he looks awesome. Uh, and now we find out in this volume, and again, spoilers, so if you don't want any, back away now, last chance, because we're going to dive into spoilers for issues 6 through 10 of Venom. Um, what do we learn about Meridius in this volume, Eddie? What's the big reveal? <sighs> that he is Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> Not the Eddie I'm talking to, not Eddie's mullet. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, Eddie Brock. <laughs> right. It's uh it, this this right here is what like I knew like I me and I was talking to like Venom and Leash and so I was like, I knew this was coming. I was like, I knew it. I was like, it's gonna just be Eddie. And yeah, it was. But they're saying it's Eddie, but it's not any other Eddie. It's the same Eddie, but at a different time, Eddie, it's like, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like, it's one of those ideas where, again, I feel like it's it's weird because, I mean, Rom V, I, I actually don't know the age of Rom V, so I don't know if he is a young guy, like in his like late 20s, early 30s. Um, I know Al Ewing's an older guy, older than me. So it, the idea of, okay, well, in the last Venom story, we had Venom fight... Um, you know, no, the king in black, the god of all symbiotes. And since Eddie beat him, who's the only bigger, badder villain we could make for this story? Oh, we'll just have Eddie fight Eddie <laughs> and we'll just create another Eddie and he'll be the, the new king in black who's in charge of the future. And that's pretty much what this is. Like when Eddie goes to the garden and meets Meridius, there's other symbiotes there like Bedlam and... Uh, and I can't remember all their names. They have like, and, yeah, like Tyro and yeah, Tyro, yeah, Finnegan. Finnegan, he's the one that turns out, yeah. So anyway, yeah. You, find, you find out like he meets them, and this guy named this symbiote called Finnegan, who's also King of Black, he runs up, and they're like, oh, not again. And he's like, no, you got to get out of here, Eddie. Like, run, run. Um, and then Bedlam shows up to like eat and devour him, and you're kind of like. Okay, what was that about? Well, later on, uh, that comes back into play. This trade room, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Cube, um, but no. Cube, Cube is a great sci-fi movie. This is not like Cube. This is like Cube 2. <laughs> Cube 2 was called Hypercube, and it dealt with time travel, and it basically was them going, let's take the concept of Cube and times it by three. Like, you know, let's take uh, this villain and make it Eddie. It's like, go bigger, go bigger and, uh, and more complicated. And, and the science makes less sense. And, you know, so, so hypercube is about time travel and you have these people doing things a couple times, a couple different ways. And you see interactions happen. So Eddie's meeting all these symbiotes and we find, and then you, we come back to that like two or three more times throughout the book. And you find out that Eddie is Finnegan and Eddie is Tyro and Eddie is Bedlam and Eddie is Meridius. <laughs> so they're just all different Eddies from different points in time based on this one linear path that Meridius needs Eddie to stay on in order to even be created. Um, so so uh, I, I, oh, I want to also, because I would totally point this out if Donnie did it. So this mm -hmm. was really nice the first time. Was it Jim Starlin, I think, that did? Uh, Adam Warlock and the Magus. I don't, yes. It's yes. it's the same story. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's a that's a good point. It's a it's a it is a kind of a recycled concept and idea. Um, whereas the stuff on Earth where they're expanding Dylan and bringing back Liz and and rebuilding the Life Foundation and having that connect to rocks on all that, 
it's like, yeah, those are there's elements in there that have been used before, but that seems to be a, a progressive moving forward type story with interesting characters. Whereas like all these different takes on Eddie from different points in time don't, I don't know, it just wasn't working for me. And then you find out Eddie goes in through time. So he's like, oh, he finds out he's Finnegan. So he goes back and tries to stop something in the past, but he ends up just warning Dylan to go to the hotel again. And you're like, oh, geez. And then he tries to go back in time again, and that leads him to becoming Finnegan. And then so he runs out to try to stop Eddie from, you know, talking to Meridius and try to tell him the truth. And then Bedlam eats him. And then he goes back in the time stream and he ends up meeting Kang the Conqueror, who Kang says that him and Eddie have been friends for eons, which uh, just makes me want to punch uh, everyone who's working on this book. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, that's where I it started to lose me. I'm like, really? Like, Kang and Eddie are friends? Like, ah, I love Kang the Conqueror so much, but um, I just, I don't know. I, I, I just find it hard with him being the new Marvel villain for the movies. I'm surprised no other writer is writing him in a book like Avengers right now and, and how he's able to be out there to be put in a Venom book randomly. Just, I don't get it. Yeah, well, Venom has been like the flagship book for Marvel. I think it's been outselling Avengers. I, I don't know if it is anymore. Right. <laughs> but, I that's mean, true. so maybe that's why they decided to stick him in there. And Ewing's been his their best-selling writer, too. So he probably had the pick of the litter. That is true. So, so what... What are your thoughts? Like, I don't know if you're a King the Conqueror fan at all. Not at all. I don't. Okay. Yeah, you're <laughs> it's, just it's, like it, from time travel, right? It is. It's a time travel thing. It, what, the only time travel I, I really ever thought was cool in comics is Cable, just because he uses big guns. <laughs> right, <laughs> but, right. And pouches. But, yeah. Right, yeah, and pouches <laughs> for days. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't... I'm, I've always thought Kang looked stupid. <laughs> I, I always hated how he looked. He, he looked like he wore a blouse, you know. <laughs> sure. I've, and so, it, it, and then when they said he's in the MCU, I was like, oh, great. Yay, Kang. Can't wait. <laughs> and then he pops up in Venom. I'm like, oh, no, I can't get away from this guy now. <laughs> yeah, like he had popped up in Cantwell's uh, Doctor Doom run. And I kind of like that because it was a little ambiguous at first if he was really there or if it was some kind of time echo that Dr. There's Doom like, was there's like millions of Kangs, right? So there's Kangs everywhere. It's kind of like what they're doing with Eddie here. There's Kang, there's this, right. there's this right. Kang, there's that Kang. Now there's this Eddie and that Eddie. Right. Um, that's true. I mean, yeah. And, uh, and so I'm like, I'm, I'm reading this and I'm going, okay, this is where the Eddie stuff is going to start to lose me because the, like I said, the writing is like, Oh, it, He's he was the one who had to stop that conversation, or he and he's the one who's also letting that conversation happen, and he's also the villain of the story. And and it it's just one of those things where all of them seem like they're not even at least right now they're not even doing because you could take that concept of okay these are different Eddies from different time periods, and you could you could actually write unique characters. You could have an Eddie that learned from you know being selfless selfish. And he learned all the wrong lessons. And then you have one that learned from all the right lessons or whatever. And he's like a better version. And maybe he secretly wants to team up with Eddie to take down Meridius. Like you can have dynamic versions of Eddie who have all learned things, but they're all just henchmen to Meridius. And Meridius is definitely written as that villain who just, he knows all the answers. Yep. So, so he's like, there's, there's hardly, it's like, no, there's not really any flaws in him. He just shows up. He has all the answers. He's uber powerful, and and you're and you're kind of like, okay, well, that's not interesting though. <laughs> like, no, it just doesn't. He's a that's a boring villain. And even though it's Eddie, it's like I don't even care what it takes for Eddie to become Meridius. I doubt it's that interesting of a story. <laughs> you know? Well, um, yeah, I mean, omnipotence is not a fun character trait to read about. Never, right. never has been. And and really, all this to me sets up is just yet another story where Eddie is left with a choice. Like, okay, do I being if I become Meridius, that means I go down a self selfish path again, and I go back in my hamster wheel, and I I push Dylan away, and I go on this selfish journey forward, and that's what turns me into Meridius. Or do I learn to love and be a selfless guy? And I'm like, didn't you already learn that lesson like a couple times? Like, I, so I just feels like that's all we're going to get out of the growth of the character is just 
a story we've already gotten before where he's already learned to do the selfless thing, you know? Right. I, it, so it seems like the end goal is here. we're going to see how he ends up becoming a Meridius. I, I'm yeah. assuming, you know, but I really just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I, it's one of those things where I hope, okay, build it up, do it for like, you know, get through dark web. And then after that, maybe do like, you know, one final six or seven issue arc. And maybe yeah. by issue 20 or 25, wrap that up. <laughs> like right. maybe maybe even wrap this whole run up um, and just get everyone back to basics and stuff. Uh, not that that's super important. I don't mind progression. Like the, the stuff with Dylan feels like progression. I'm like, this is neat. It's it's stepping forward. But, I've, but having a literal time travel story at the same time where Eddie constantly is going back in time, I'm like, you guys are... You guys are in your own way. You're, 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 you have a story that's moving forward and a B story that's moving backwards. <laughs> and, yep. it's not, and they're not like interestingly coinciding together, at least in my opinion. No, no. Like it's, it's kind of bad when I, I thought the best issue, like the better issues have been like the biker gang, the, the, the uh, middle yeah. of this. The middle of this time travel story, we stopped off at a Sons of Anarchy episode. It was, <laughs> and it it was fine. I didn't care. I mean, yeah. that's like it reminded me more of Venom books than any of this other stuff. Well, that's the one thing is uh, Dylan is running around California, and he's kind of circling mm -hmm. the San Francisco area, which is cool because obviously that's a connection to Venom too. Um, but then he also, uh, like you said, there's this one episode where he got picked up by a guy driving a truck because he's like on the run. He has no father around. And him and Sleeper and Venom, who's disguised as a dog, so it's him, his cat, and his dog. Uh, it's like homeward bound. And the three mm -hmm. of them are like, uh, they're on this road trip and they end up in this small town where he gets caught up with this guy named Jake and there's a biker gang war going on. And and Dylan takes on the Venom suit and goes and destroys the drugs and, and guns and everything of the rival gang trying to help this guy who's been helping him so that he can retire and have a life of peace. And turns out it just causes more bloodshed. Um, but yeah, I ended up liking that. I was like, yeah, this is great. This, what a great little story in the middle of this bull crap. And then the jury, the jury, new, the new member of the jury shows up and hits, you know, Dylan knocks him down a peg or two. So yeah, spearhead spearhead. Yeah. Right. Um, so it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, such a cheesy name but it's it's so fitting with the 90s it's like it reminded me like of a 90s villain right yeah yeah so i feel like there's a, a level of them embracing the property they have and the, the ip they're writing in venom mm -hmm. like i feel like there's definitely an air of that throughout the book but then there's also this like they're weighed down by this big cosmic side that they they have to address yeah <laughs> yep. and 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 maybe um maybe we're wrong about that maybe the they love writing that stuff and they, maybe they like it more than the street level stuff. But for me, I'm like, I, I just was happy there was as much street level stuff in this as I, I thought it was just going to be all cosmic. And I was very happy it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not happy that it's not Eddie, but I, I did enjoy those parts for like, for the time. I enjoyed the, you know, the flash venom run for as much as I was surprised that I did. But yeah, those, those are the stories that, I me personally enjoy the best is when he's up against odds and he's vulnerable. I, you know, vulnerability is gives you stakes, I suppose. Exactly. Well, let's real quick before we wrap this episode up too. Let's let's talk about speaking of stakes and stuff and missions. Like we know what Meridius he kind of wants. He's he he wants control of time right now because he has an an end goal of some kind. And if we read the Thor issues you kind of get a little sense of that where he wants to change his future on some level um, so, or some event that happens. So I don't know if it's like the death of Dylan or, or what it is, but something propels him down a road and he wants to undo it. And Thor tells him, well, if you change that event, what will happen to your loved ones? You know, if you change it. And that's when Meridius says something to him, like, you know, we were almost friends, Thor. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking Eddie is, he is thinking about that or this version of Eddie Meridius is thinking about what it'll do to his loved ones. And maybe that's why he wants to change it. So we don't fully know exactly what's what he's aiming for yet, but it's not good. I mean, a lot of bad things have happened because of this. He also brought Carlton Drake back. He helped Carlton Drake get, you know, get back to his human form so he could rebuild the life foundation and bail out rocks on an Alchemex. And now they're all working together and Archer betrays Dylan. And there's all these, you know, things going on on earth that are because of Meridius's actions 
But Carlton Drake has a goal of his own. The reason he's putting the jury together, it's not like he just wants to capture, um, you know, Dylan and, and the symbiote. He wants to he wants to just keep hurting the symbiote. He wants Spearhead and other jury members that they're going to start creating. He just wants to beat the crap out of Venom to see what the suit will become. He believes the suit is like a butterfly, and there's even butterflies flying around the suit at one point in the comic where where it's like wounded and stuff. And uh, so Carlton Drake believes that this form of symbiotes, this is just the next stage of symbiotes, but there's a stage beyond it. If you wound it enough, it'll reveal another version of its true nature. So I don't know if I'm that interested in, in them changing the symbiote fundamentally like that. Um, I guess we'll have to see what it turns into, but that seems to be his goal. And, uh, and along that, along those lines, you know, he seems to be trying to do his own thing and just playing puppet to Meridius, but still trying to do his own thing. So are you liking Carlton Drake back? And does that storyline interest you at all? Yeah. There, there just hasn't been enough of them for me. <laughs> sure. Right. Yeah. Um, it's true. Yeah. It just, the, the thing that, that keeps you know, I guess weighing me down in this whole series is they they said that I I, I think it's Kang, right? Who tells him, no, this this is not any other Eddie. This is the same Eddie. Right. They they, they, they were pretty definitive in that. So this at some this our I guess our quote unquote Eddie Brock will eventually be that Meridius. So mm-hmm. I I'm just like, well, then why would he? I don't know. I they've got a lot of explaining to do. Because <laughs> it's it's I, I I mean I don't mind a mystery in a book, but I don't like reading it and being like, huh? <laughs> after I, yeah. after I'm done, so and that's what time travel. That's why I don't like time travel books. So <laughs> right, well, and that, and that's the thing we criticize Donnie for, which is like, get to the point. Like you you had a good setup issue, and that's yeah. kind of how I feel this is. You had a good setup arc the first five issues, so it's like okay, now now start delivering, and it. It, they are peeling back the layers and, and doing reveals every almost every issue in this volume has some kind of reveal. So the the it's definitely you know the snowball is gaining speed and it's it's gaining size and rolling downhill. But then like you said, we're gonna we're gonna hit a bump with Dark Web, but but luckily Dark Web's only like two issues I think or three issues crossing over, and and I hope they just fly through that real quickly and and get to yeah. Uh, so another thing that this. So how many, what issue are we at by the end of this, uh, this so trade I think, here? Uh, 10, issue 10. It just goes 6 to 10. So I think those 10 issues uh, from these first two uh, mm-hmm. trades, that took a year to get those issues out because of those printer press delays. And that did not help this story, which is a slow-burning story. It drug right. it out even more. There, I think there was like, we had a couple months between a few issues, and it, it was like... It's like it, it's just it's been a long road, and those delays didn't help this story at all. Well, that's one thing is uh, like I again, I know we're both critical of Brian Hitch, but he's not he did some Justice League stuff over at DC where he was a writer and artist, and I think he did like a year or two's worth of that. And he mostly stayed the pace, although the book was late a couple times, I believe. Um, but he's typically late on books because of it just you know, for it takes a lot to do his artwork, and I'm not gonna, you know. Uh, hold that against them uh, for the most part, but for a monthly book and one that already had delays. Uh, so I think they try to cheat that in this book by reusing pages. And so they're like, hey, we can we have this story that's structured to where a Brian Hitch artist can work on it because these three pages, he doesn't have to draw again. We'll just reuse them in the next issue. Um, so that's fine. It's it, That's smart business-wise to do that, I guess, um, and get the book out there. But I will say after Dark Web, they might want to consider getting a different artist for the monthly book and start picking up speed because you told me that. Now, I had the luxury of just reading all of them, you know, this past week uh, together, all 10 issues. So I didn't have to wait. Um, but people who were buying it monthly did. And that does massively affect the story. That's one of the reasons Ghost Rider with uh, Ed Breeson got canceled was because it was a good book little slow at first but then by issue seven with all the printing delays and everything they're like we got we can't, we can't do this anymore you know mm-hmm. and we got we got to reboot ghost rider again so um <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh so yeah well may, maybe we'll get 20 issues of this 25 issues and then they'll they'll reboot venom again which will be fine um well la- last thoughts on this one because like i said there's a lot of revelations in this issue but not all of them were ones that we liked so and a rating score, what would you say you give volume two of Venom? 
down i'm down to like the twos now i because it it two to <laughs> two one and a half two somewhere i would the the eddie reveal the average art it just it was it was a kick in the teeth <laughs> yeah yeah i like um i luckily i knew that going in so i was kind of prepared for it so maybe that's why it felt less stupid when they revealed it but i will say the reveal felt very anticlimactic like and maybe it's and i don't know if that's because i already knew it or not so you'll have to tell me if, if how you felt but like yeah go ahead no, when i when i turned it and i seen it i'm like <laughs> yeah i was like of course right you know we got to have an eddie verse now i'm just like right. oh that, that's what i it, it just reminded me of spider verse and all these you know other dimension but it's not it's not it's the same one but it's not and now somehow bedlam has spawned a symbiote but it's eddie that that's a whole nother question how bedlam has spawned but it's eddie as a uh, yeah i don't know comic yeah. books I mean, yeah, and they, they do all kind of things like that. I think they reference a little bit Venom the End because in Venom the End, there was like a the symbiote was at the end of time. It had a, a the last host it could find in the universe, and it was fighting these monsters or the phalanx or something like that. And it can create energy beams with his hands. There was a point in this where Eddie's talking to Kang, and he's in a war suit, like a war symbiote yeah. suit, and he shoots fire from his hands, which I was like, what the f <laughs> like what yeah. the hell? So I'm I'm guessing like. Carlton Drake's right. The symbiotes will be able to do more things or become other things. And I guess that's what we're seeing throughout the versions of Eddie with Meridius and, and War and all those guys. So I'm like, okay, all the elements are there, but I'm much like you, this brought me down. Like I, I felt like the last one I gave the three to three and a half, but this one gets like a definitive two and a half. Like I'm like right in the middle because I'm like, I like the street level stuff. I like that biker story. I like things like that. But the more they dive into Meridius and this thing, I'm just, I, I, I'm so detached. Like I don't find him interesting at all. And mm -hmm. normally, like when they did, when Jason Aaron did that with Thor, like, oh, here's future Thor, and he's, you know, he's the All Father. Now he's existing with present day Thor, and they team up with past Thor. It's it, again, it's a concept that is just circulating at Marvel, where it's just like one writer does it, then the next writer does it, and the next writer does it, and I'm kind of like, you know how characters, I always say, they get on these hamster wheels so do writers and, and editors and i kind of wish they would all just throw away all their hamster wheels and just really try something different right and i feel like this book has one foot in that and one foot out of it still um so so yeah so anyway i give it a two and a half out of five that's like i i just i want the meridius stuff to be over already <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah you ever notice his head looks like a spider too if you turn him upside down it's Oh sure, Bizarre. yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's all kind of like, I, I'm, like I said, I've noticed all the, the like the butterfly when they showed that in the panel. Like, there's all these like art school filmmaker bullcrap college student like <laughs> con concepts that are like, this, it's so cool. Look, we're making it. It's like, dude, you're not Al Ewing. You're not 22, <laughs> and I don't think Ron V's 22 either. Like, you guys aren't filmmakers in in college making these you know, amateur decisions that you think are genius at the time, but have been done a million times before. Like, I, you guys, well, yeah. I'm, when I know not getting into carnage too much yet, but from reading this to reading carnage, I, it's, I, I'd never even guess it. It's the same writer. If it, that it's Rom, that's what I think. A lot of this is he's following Ewing's outlines and directions and he's filling in the blanks for him. Well, I know it's like from working at kind of companies in the past, there's there's always different ways for collaboration. Sometimes someone literally comes up with a story and the other person writes out all the beats and everything. And then sometimes you get someone who, who just does the prose captions where they describe what's in each panel. And then they just ask someone to do the dialogue, um, you know, but but give them like a, a, like a vague notion of what needs to happen on each page. Um, but I don't see why like, it's weird to me. I'm like, it, Al Ewing's not so busy, I feel, unless he's like, was sick or, you know, going through something at the time, which I don't know his personal life and it's not a big deal, but I don't, I'm, I'm wondering why they teamed up on this. Like, I'm like, what's the advantage of having like a big writer and a, an up and coming writer on this book specifically? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe they both pitched an idea and Devin Lewis or, you know, the editors liked both and they said, hey, you got a cool Dylan story. You got a cool Eddie story. Let's combine them. 
maybe maybe it's that simple. Um, yeah. But I can't wait to read Carnage because I know you told me you really liked it, and I think the first trade comes out in like two weeks. So I'll pick it up and 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 sometime if we can before the holidays, we'll try to meet back up on here and talk about it. Yeah, it sounds yeah. good. Awesome. Um, cool. Well, hey, man, I, again, I can't thank you enough for your time. I really appreciate you coming on here again. No, I appreciate you coming in anytime. Yeah, hell yeah. And uh, everyone, um, you can't go find Eddie anywhere, so just comment down below um, of, you know, what if you have any feedback for us, what you thought of the book, and we'll definitely jump down there and, uh, and respond to you guys and keep the conversation going for sure. Um, awesome, man. Well, thank you again. And everyone who's watching and listening, thank you so much as well. Um, hopefully you like Eddie's avatar. I brought that back with the mullet and everything. Uh, so, so if you do give us a thumbs up and uh, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and we'll see you in the future. Peace.